Hello to everyone coming in right now. We're going to wait another 30 seconds or so for people to sign in, get settled, and we'll begin. Okay, great. Let's get started. People are going to continue to file in. We have a huge crowd here. Great. I love the uh, everyone's greeting each other in the chat. Um, my name is Greg Kogan. I'm with Pinecone. I'm delighted to host this online workshop with uh, the folks at ProLego and our very own uh, one of our product managers. We're going to talk about uh, why LLM size doesn't matter and why context does and what that means for your business and your AI initiatives. Um, we'll spend about 30 minutes uh, uh, presenting some interesting information and actionable information. Then we'll spend 30 minutes on Q&A. Uh, I'll tell you now, uh, you are free to ask questions as we go. Please use the Q&A feature. Uh, it might be labeled ask a question. That way, uh, you'll ensure we don't miss it. We'll have it in a nice list. All right, so is it my audio that went flaky? Or nope, I, I can't I can't hear Greg either. So okay. you may have dropped. All right, Greg dropped. The show's gonna go on without Greg. So I'm gonna keep going then unless you want to take over, Nathan. So no, go ahead, go ahead, please. Okay. Hey Greg, you're back. I was just about to take over. So here you are. I'm back. You know what? Yeah, I'll I'll just do a quick introduction. I'll introduce Nathan Cordero, who's a principal product uh, manager at Pinecone, uh, who led the RAG study that you'll hear about soon. Um, and then we have Kevin DeWalt and uh, Dr. Justin Pounders from uh, ProLego, which is uh, an incredible AI consulting firm based in Washington, DC. And they will present their findings and takeaways as well. This is a panel of extraordinary experts who have been doing AI ML for a long time, and I'm excited to learn from them. With that, I'm going to pass it to Kevin. Kevin, take it away. All right. Thanks, everybody. So um, Kevin DeWalt, I'm founder and CEO of Prolego. Uh, we're an AI services company. We've been in business about eight years, and we primarily focus on helping accelerate AI at the Fortune 1000 companies. Um, so mostly doing strategy and a combination of custom engineering process projects. And so lots of RAG experiences, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, Justin Pounders leads our AI and data science initiatives. He's going to be on off camera mute and ready to jump in for answering questions. And so I'm going to give a kind of a high level overview. And then when you have good questions, Justin can answer them. Can he has done the work. Uh, so uh, here's the agenda for today. So I'm going to start off by talking about the, the, the challenge that a lot of product teams are going to find when you try to actually begin deploying these models and where the conventional wisdom collides with reality and, and what you can do to sort of think through your options. Uh, Nathan is going to talk about the study they did, uh, which we found incredibly interesting and actually inspired us to do our own similar study, which confirms similar results. I'm going to share those results and talk about some of the implications it means for product teams. And I expect we're going to get a lot of great questions at the end. Um, so with that in mind, let's just talk about the challenges and uh, what are the challenges you have when building enterprise large scale RAG systems? And so I have, uh, I've actually built my first neural network uh, exactly 30 years ago. Uh, it was in MATLAB at about five neurons. And of course it didn't work very well, like a lot of the history of AI. And if you look at the trajectory of our industry over definitely the past decade, it's really, it's a story of scale. And we've had some theoretical breakthroughs around, you know, convolutional neural networks and attention that have led to, you know, incremental changes. But in the end, what is driving value since we started deploying large-scale neural networks, the, these deep learning techniques uh, you know, a decade ago? And that is bigger is better, right? Bigger models, more compute, more data, better results. 
And the two charts I have here on the screen sort of reinforce that point. One is from AWS, where they're you know charting the exponential growth of these recent large language models. This I think they released this a few weeks before GPT four came out, so they were calling it GPT three in the the top right there. But estimates that we're talking now models with more than a billion or more than a trillion parameters. And recently we've seen this announcement from Google talking about Gemini one point five, you know, a million context windows. So this leads to these these online discussions about you know, how, you know, these giant models, giant contact windows are going to solve all your problems is take all your data and stuff it in there and everything will be magic. And so this is like how, how we think about this, but for teams building problems, bigger is better actually has some practical implications. The one we run into all the time, believe it or not, is policy. Now this is fortunately starting to change, but the biggest models are currently available primarily through APIs, through one of the third party companies we know about Anthropic, Google, Microsoft, OpenAI. And a lot of teams just don't have access to them because they don't have the data policy permissions to be able to send their data outside of their environment. And even if their company is using one of these APIs, that the team, a, a particular work team may not have access to it. They may not have permission to use it by their team on their data. And so a team can be faced with a situation where they have to either spend six months you know, talking to lawyers and, and operations people about sending data outside of their environment, or if they want to get going, just using a smaller or open source large language model they can host internally. So policy issues are a challenge. And for teams that think, hey, we need the biggest and the best, a lot of times they just won't start because they think they're blocked because it's not going to work that well. The other big issue is cost. And it's a it's a very telling sign when you see people, who, uh, we, social media chats on LinkedIn about you know building rag system and deploying things at scales. And it's pretty obvious who's doing real work and who's not. The cost of running these largest language models can get extremely expensive when you start modeling them out at scale. And I think the recent pricing from Anthropic around their Claude 3 model provides a, a great example of this. So they've got three different model sizes and you know, and cost and, and intelligence, they have this kind of little you know, chart here. But if you actually model this out a bit, taking the average cost of the input and the output for these particular models, you you get about, um, you, know, you, you, you take an average and any, imagine building an application that runs at you know around 100,000 tokens per user per hour, which by the way, is not high volume. I mean, these models could take us 200,000 tokens in a single call. So we're talking about a fairly moderate application. Well, if you compare the cost of a small model or high coup, you're looking at about nine cents an hour versus the largest one, which is four and a half bucks an hour. And that's a 50 times difference. That may not matter if you're building a demo solution or something maybe for a lawyer, but when you're talking about anything that operates at scale in a call center or a larger analytics team, suddenly the price of running these models can start to encroach on the cost of, of human labor and human intelligence. Um, and uh, obviously that's just for the LLM. That's not the cost of doing everything else you need to do to build one of these systems. So cost becomes a big deal. The final one, which you will appreciate if you've tried to build any complex, anything complex, is just speed. And uh, the this chart here from uh, a company called Artificial Analysis that kind of benchmarks large language models is a good example of this Mistral 7B, one of the more popular small language models. It just runs a lot faster than something like the bigger models from one of the major providers. And the the challenge with the uh, with the challenge with the larger models is if you start building anything that requires multiple LLM calls, complex workflows, or maybe you're using agents and reviews in your particular application, it can get really slow. And running a query that takes several minutes, aside from the being a, a rather miserable development, you know, exercise, just often doesn't get adopted by users because it's too slow. And if you start trying to do any kind of experiments with these models on large data sets. If a data scientist runs a job and it takes nine hours to process all the data through GPT-4, it just brings your development velocity to a crawl, and it really has an, an ROI impact on your projects. So these are the real-world challenges you run into. And here's the conventional wisdom. And again, this is from artificial analysis. It's, a, it's an analysis of this Mistral 7B model. And I really like this chart because I think it captures the reflexive opinion that people have about all these technologies. And that is smaller models, they're cheaper, 
they're faster, but the quality is not as good. And you know, you, a quick scan of this chart reveals what everybody thinks: like, ooh, you know, twenty-eight, you know, versus a hundred. They know that's you know, that's really bad. It's not going to work. And so, the conventional wisdom is: if you want to have the best performance, you have to use the biggest, most the the most effective models. And as we're about to explore, that conventional wisdom is not true. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nathan. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so my name is Nathan Cordero. I'm a product manager at Pinecone. And today I'm going to tell you about a RAG study undertaken by the Pinecone research and machine learning teams. Next slide, please. Okay, so we set out to understand the relationship between model scale, uh, learned knowledge, that is like the knowledge that uh, the model incorporates into itself, and retrieve knowledge, i.e. the intelligence that the knowledge is um, incorporating via external sources. Specifically, we already knew that RAG solutions work really well for private or domain-specific knowledge, i.e. use cases where the model has not seen the data before. But what we wanted to test was whether we could improve the performance on general knowledge, that is, specifically, the knowledge that the model was trained on or should know by providing the model with an external knowledge base that it could retrieve from. We also wanted to try and answer the question as to whether scaling up these large language models, both in terms of size and training data, is the best way to solve for knowledge intensive tasks. Uh, next slide. So to describe the experiment that we ended up running, um, we started with Refined Web, which is a data set published by TII, who are the makers of the Falcon large language model. Refined Web is a filtered version of the crawled web uh, with data primarily coming from Common Crawl and with other sources that have been refined for quality and for deduplication. What we did is extract a set of 1,000 factual questions using an LLM. Think of these as questions that could be answered definitively based on knowledge in the open domain. For example, where was the author of the three-body problem born? We then created a scaled database of over a thousand, or sorry, a billion vectors from the refined web uh, corpus. The data was broken down using 512 token chunks and encoded using the Cohere Embed V3 model. We're able to host this model or this data at scale using uh, Pinecone serverless uh, efficiently, which is our new architecture designed for low latency, efficient, and performant vector retrieval at scale. For the actual experiment, we use faithfulness, a metric developed by the Ragus framework and commonly used to measure performance of Gen AI systems. Faithfulness measures how factually consistent a model's response is with the information acquired during the retrieval process. That is, how well does the generated answer correspond to the ground truth? In this case, we're treating the source documents of the web as the ground truth. Uh, next slide. So looking at the results. Uh, the first the first experiment was to observe the relationship between the size of the data we make available externally and overall faithfulness. In this experiment, we instruct the models to only use the retrieved information to answer the question that's being asked. There shouldn't be much surprise here at the low end. If you only have a small amount of data to retrieve against, then the model has very few resources to work with. And correspondingly, you can see that faithfulness was very low. As you scale up on the higher end, you can see that as we scaled from 10 million to 100 million to a billion data set sizes, we saw continued improvements in faithfulness. And another thing to note about this is that we never saw a scaling plateau. So presumably this um, performance would increase uh, to the higher scales as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the, probably the most important uh, experiment that we ran in this study. In this experiment, we compared the base models using their own internal knowledge to the base models using only the retrieved models via RAG. So remember, the, the models that we're testing against here, GPT-4, GPT-3.5, Mixtral, and Llama-2, are trained on this exact data set, which is the, uh, the crawled web. For some open source models where the training details are public, web data has been stated to be up to 70% or more of the training data. So you would expect the models to perform really well on this task. Still, we see here that our RAG solution performs meaningfully better than the models in the comparison set. This includes both private and public, that is like open source models, 
It includes both models that are optimized for cost, i.e. smaller models, and models optimized for performance, that is state-of-the-art models like GPT-4. I think a key insight here is that you can get great results from these pipelines without having to rely on the most powerful models available or private models. Uh, next slide. So bringing it all together, we ran a final experiment which combined both the public and the private uh, information together. In this experiment, we allowed the model to choose between using its own internal knowledge or using the RAG-based external knowledge. Uh, what you see here is that this guarantees some level of baseline performance, but allows you still to lever the power of external knowledge at the higher scales. So around 10 million data points, we start to see the performance of this system match those of the, uh, the, the models themselves. And then as you scale to 100 million or a billion data points, we see that we exceed the performance of the models themselves. Okay, next slide. All right, so in conclusion, you know, the, the study kind of proved that models have this, you know, very complex challenge of balancing the learning of information, the processing of language, and reasoning capabilities all within the same set of model weights. What we found is the long tail of knowledge is like very, very long, and any attempt to build a model that knows everything by scaling up is starting to reach points of diminishing return. And finally, by using a RAG ar architecture like the one proposed, we open up different operating points and different trade-offs. For example, you have the ability to leverage open source models and smaller models that can enable use cases uh, like privacy or you know, different operating points in terms of cost without having to sacrifice performance. And with that, I'll kind of hand it back to, to Kevin. Thank you so much, Nathan. If you if you're interested in this, I would really encourage you to take a look at this the study that they have on their site. This is really well written, and it goes into a lot of detail around the methodology and the results there. And it's a it's just a it's a great read and really well presented. Um, so and uh, and part of the ins inspiration of that study was a study that we ran. Uh, and I'm, now I'm going to talk about a, a in another independent study that actually confirmed the general same theme that Nathan described. And so I'm going to walk through the study results. Justin Pounders actually did the work, and so he'll be available to answer the Q&A uh, with some of the questions that I can anticipate. And I'm going to lead with the bottom line up front. Um, so this, this chart, I think, kind of summarizes the way I now think about these models. And the the chart here it, it shows the difference in performance between the base model, which is no rag, no context, essentially going into you know GPT four model, whatever, asking a question and getting an answer, versus that where you're providing the right context. Don't get hung up on the individual size of these bars here, because as I'm describing in a second, you know, this is a a the study only had twenty five questions for a deliberate reason, which I'll describe. So slight differences in how questions are answered or evaluated can result in bars. It's the fact that when you add right context, the differences between these large language models starts to disappear. And so back to the way I presented this up in this particular instance, you can have your cake and eat it too. And you can get, you can leverage the speed cost and basically deployment flexibility of small and open source language, large language models. And for this particular case, not all of them, as I'll say in a minute, they can provide equal performance. So those are the results. Let me just describe the motivating questions so you can kind of put this in context. So we get hired by large companies to come in there and build complex uh, bespoke systems and work through a lot of these challenges. And I'll just say we are for hire. So if you're interested in talking about a project, just Kevin at ProLego.com, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and in part of doing this, uh, our work, we have come up what we call an LLM optimization playbook. Um, and so we think of RAG not as like a system, but as an optimization. It's one of 13 different techniques you can use to, to build, make your LLM system better. You can choose, and what are the kind of techniques? You can get better models. You can get better model versions. You can add agents. You can add context. You can add RAG, you know, on and on and on. Workflow, um, different choices, uh, 
So those are 13 model choice. We wanted to do an ablation study and figure out what, what impacts RAG. You know, do agents make a difference? Do Does context, does RAG make a difference? Does the model choice make a difference? We wanted to do a study that tested those. And the second one is we wanted to see how open source LLMs work on real world problems. So on so how do small and, and open source LLMs work on the kind of problems we see in healthcare and banking and retail and in manufacturing where you have multiple documents, where you have complex document structure, where you have arcane terminology relevant to your industry or relevant to maybe your particular products or services, and where you have human generated questions, which is why we have such a small set of questions for the experiment. Um, it is straightforward to build a RAG application for a, a website that has r restaurant reviews for, for uh, New York City restaurants. But to try to build something that actually solves a business problem is significantly harder. And so I'm going to show you what we mean by complex documents and human generated questions. The set of documents we used for this experiment was the Formula One rule books. And we, we like the set of docs because they are technical, they're arcane, but they're available in the public domain. So we could have access to them and, and, use, uh, and, and other people could also evaluate and replicate what we were doing. Here's an excerpt from the Formula, Formula One rules book. And you'll notice that you know, it has this exclusion sections. So when we talk about like complex hierarchy, this is an example of, of what we think of as negation and something we'll run into in, in situations like healthcare. If you imagine doing any kind of analytics or a, you know, a chat with your document type RAG application on this data, being able to re retain the structure that these are excluded costs under here is really important because that's the information that it's designed to, to be absorbed through by a person reading this. We see this often in the cases of, of like healthcare, like life insurance. If you get an attending physician statement, it says, you know, patient does not have the following, you know, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and they list all the diseases. Well, obviously previous versions of machine learning, whatever, would just detect like the word cancer, this would give it exactly the wrong signal because you lost that structure. And this is one of the biggest challenges we see with actually deploying these, these kind of complex RAG systems inside the enterprise. The other one is including uh, additional context or arcane knowledge. And so... Oftentimes the, the products you have, the services you have, these may have identical or similar names to what you would find in the in the public domain on the on the data that the models, the foundational models were trained on. And so something like an excluded persons has a particular meaning that it's important to have the, the model understand to be able to answer this. And so again, we wanted to test these these smaller and open source large language models on these type of, of complex documents. And now uh, why we only have 25 questions and that's because we wanted to do human generated questions. So Justin built the, the set of test questions, which we have a, a link to on the study if you're interested in looking at them that were from a combination of sort of like uh, fan based questions or based on uh, crash reports from formula one. And it turns out that human-generated questions and user questions tend to be a lot messier, ambiguous, and shorter than what an LLM would come up with. So here's an example of two questions related to driver salaries. So a person is likely to say, are Formula One driver salaries included in the cost cap? So I'm not a Formula One fan, but my understanding is Formula One works kind of like, you know, the NFL salary cap where you can only spend so much on, you know, you know on your cars and, and players and parts. Well, the answer is no, driver salary is not included. And when I asked ChatGPT to generate a question based on driver salaries, you know, it came back with this very long question, which starts to look like an extraction from the source materials. And you know, both of these questions are trying to answer this question here, you know, this this section of text. But ChatGP generates it and actually references the specific section. So this is a lot easier for an LLM to, to process than something that's ambiguous. So that in this study, we took these 25 evaluation questions and we designed four stages of system complexity based on those 13 optimization techniques that I described. 
So stage zero is starting with just a base LLM. So GPT-4, GPT-3.5, you know, Mistral 7B, just ask it a question. And sometimes the models can provide a decent answer because a lot of the Formula One information is in the public domain, in media reports and news articles. And so there's enough information out there about the sport that it can start answering some questions. The second stage of complexity is adding the basic RAG, the kind of you know foundational RAG document search techniques. There's a third one where we add additional context, which Justin can talk about, or you can read the study. All the way up to the fourth one, stage three, where we added all these things, where we had RAG context and agents through a more complex workflow. And in each stage, we ran the set of 25 questions multiple times. We did an evaluation, wanted to see how well did the different models perform. And the results are... Pretty much, you could probably guess what the results were based on uh, what Nathan shared and what I shared earlier. Is that the biggest jump was RAG. So providing the knowledge of the documents made the biggest lift. And then as we added additional context, it, it, it got more consistent results and it tended to have smoother. And then by the time we got up to adding agents, uh, it didn't improve it at all. In fact, it actually started to detract from the performance of the models. And again, don't get caught up in the individual heights of the bars here. You know, this is, you know, 3.5 isn't worse than, you know, Mistral 7B. Because there's only 25 questions, you know, one or two answers or one or two interpretations can radically shift shift them. The, the real information here is that the, the trend is what matters. So those are the key findings. And so in the last minute or two here, I'm going to try to wrap up with some key takeaways. And so the what I would say is bigger is not always better. And the the conventional wisdom does not always uh, always uh, does not always carry. So before you begin scoping a project, really consider where you want to invest your time and your resources and, and your money. And you will probably find that you get a higher ROI from any of these projects by investing in 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 data and team and and tools and having you know the right data storage for your for your, all your vectors, right? So. As you start thinking about maybe the default to GPT-4 or Claude through one of these big ones, just because it's like easier and quicker, um, cost, whether or not it's worth spending months fighting with lawyers, if you can spin something up locally inside your cloud provider on your local environment on a GPU, that's a smaller open source models, and just the latency, the, the impact on your development velocity and, and then user experience. So that's takeaway one. Takeaway two is to test on your data. Um, so uh, it's remarkably easy to get a quick pass understanding of whether or not a RAG application, whether or not an LLM is going to be kind of good enough on your RAG application with some quick tests. And so um, here's an example of one of those. I went into Perplexity's a, a Perplexity Labs interface, and they've got a bunch of different models that you can select. I selected, where was it? Mistral 7B in here. And then I ran a little experiment. I pretended that I had built a RAG application that was going to chat with our, our corporate pet policy. So I took our corporate policy into a corporate uh, pet policy. I pasted it in here. And I uh, tried, and actually, I don't have a corporate pet policy. I use ChatGPT to generate the pet, pet policy. So um, we actually generated data for this test. And I tried to trick the Claude 3, I'm sorry, I used Claude 3 Haiku. I used the smallest model. I tried to trick it, basically, by saying, I've got an iguana, but it's three pounds, has the vaccines, and basically try to check all the boxes for being able to bring a pet to work to see if I could trick the smallest model. And the model was a trick. This this tiny little haiku model realized that exotic animals, reptiles are not permitted. It pulled an extraction right from the policy to have the answer. So I don't have to actually build out the entire RAG application to be able to run these type of quick tests and figure out, is my model going to be good enough? So that is the second uh, takeaway is to test on your data. Again, the test we ran, only one set of data, only one 25 questions. And we did not ask it to perform complex analysis on topics such like using agents or complex reasoning. Uh, so, and finally is, um, is really to include, think about scale when you're doing your POC and as you're planning your particular roadmap. It is very easy to get something running 
quickly in a proof of concept without putting a lot of thought into what your infrastructure is going to look like. Um, but before you start heading down that path, consider how you're going to want to use your infrastructure, your tools, and what the implications are. And so two takeaways, build your RAG POC with Pinecone, and please check out our LLM optimization playbook, and you can get a free copy at prolego.com playbook. Um, and that is the conclusion of our uh, presentation. Uh, we're available to answer whatever questions you have. Greg, do you want to give any transition here or should we just jump right into it? Yeah, I just, I just want to remind folks, uh, first of all, thank you, Kevin and uh, Nathan. Um, I want to remind folks, if you have questions, we have lots of them already. So if you want a chance for yours to get answered, get it in now. You do that by clicking the Ask Question button. And we're going to go in the order they were submitted. Um, whatever ones we don't get to, we'll follow up on afterwards, but get them in now. Um, Kevin, Nathan, uh, Justin, go right ahead. You can open the Q&A panel and uh, just remember to read them out uh, so everyone knows what the question is and uh, go at it. Okay. Uh, Nathan or Justin, you want to take the RAGAS type question, faithfulness there? I know you guys have both worked with this. Sure, I, I can. I'm sorry. I can take this one. Uh, how the question is how is faithfulness measured? So, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So faithfulness, if if you're not familiar with it, is a is a measure that was um, put forward by RAGAS, which is an evaluation framework for kind of Gen AI applications. It, it tries to measure how how well a generated answer um, corresponds to the supporting document that um, that it is referencing. So for a RAG application, that would likely be the, the context that was generated. Um, so uh, what, what you do is you basically use an LLM to ascertain whether the generated answer and the retrieved context are uh, referring to the same thing. So you actually do use an LLM to perform the evaluation of the faithfulness metric, and you kind of aggregate it over a number um, query kind of answer and context pairs, and you end up with an overall faithfulness metric for um, a, a given a given system. All right, thank you. And we've got a lot of questions in here, more than we can possibly answer. I, I'm going to have to triage and try to pick out the ones where I think that we are most qualified to answer. But some of there's some very domain specific ones where we may not be as helpful. So apologize if I'm not able to get to yours. All right, so uh, could you share an example where vector retrieval is used in strengthening the safety security of LLM applications? Nathan, I think this is over to you again. Uh, yeah, um, so I think, I think, um, I've seen this happen quite often where you can build RAG systems like the one that we put forward here to specifically answer if they don't know um, and only provide uh, grounded answers. So part of this is the prompt engineering. Part of this is how you kind of engineer your RAG system. But you can effectively, you know, have your chatbot only respond to questions that it can more definitively answer. So you kind of reduce the overall hallucination rate and you can push that hallucination rate like pretty far down using a, a system like this. So um, I, I think that's one of the major benefits of these RAG systems is that you can kind of make, make sure that when it does answer questions, it's answering them in a way that you can be confident is, is grounded. Um, and that's one of the, I think the, the real kind of features of, of building RAG systems like this. All right. I mean, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so I'm going to take this one because it's going to be somewhat controversial. So, uh, and I, I want to make sure that it's I'm interpreted correctly. So, the main downside I see from switching from GPT models to alternatives is to lose the capabilities of function calling and lang chain implementations. Do you see this changing in the upcoming months? Uh, strong opinion, weekly held here. Uh, we have generally found that most teams working on production employments find that the the uh, I guess these these frameworks like Langchain and Llama Index are difficult to work with because they're very new and a lot of the underlying standards are not created yet. So that's a great example of why when you Langchain is is under a lot of development, the the, the LLM architectures and best practices are changing quickly. 
And so we, if you, you can't use their out-of-the-box function calling, if you go to a different LLM because of how it's wired, do I see this changing in the upcoming months? I see it becoming increasingly difficult because everything is changing so fast. And what I would encourage you to do is see if you can actually code in some of these interfaces like function calling yourself, which is what a lot of teams end up doing because building this code is actually not that complex. Um, all right. Regarding embeddings, did you guys test different embeddings, X cost, speed, and quality of the response? I don't, we did not. I don't know. Was that part of your study, Nathan? I don't uh, know. No, we did not. It is an interesting kind of dimension to, yeah. to explore and could be an interesting kind of um, follow up. Can you pro provide more details around the RAG architecture that you used in the study? So it would be really helpful if you tell us if it's the Pinecone study, the Prolego study, otherwise we're going to be guessing. But um, can you can you provide more details around the RAG architecture that you used in this study? For example, was a re-ranker used for context? What was the number of results returned from the similarity search to the RAG? What type of similarity search was used? So I think this applies to ours. I'm not sure if it applies to yours, Nathan. But Justin, do you want to take that one? Sure. The questions are around how you did context ranking. Anyway, it's the details of how you built the thing. Yeah, for the retrieval system for us, it was it's relatively standard in the sense that we take the pieces of text, we embed them, then do a cosine similarity uh, based lookup to get the most similar pieces of text based on the cosine similarity. But then to your question, we did pass those through a re-ranker to resort the top 10, 15, 20 uh, results based on cosine similarity. And then those retrieved pieces of text were passed to the yellow in this context. Yeah, and I mean, actually on our side, our, our architecture was pretty similar. We use kind of Pinecone as a fundamental vector DB. So of course we have our own kind of similarity search algorithms, but um, we returned something around 10, 10 to 20 results. We ran a Cohere re-ranker on those as well before um, providing them to the LLM. All right. Um, okay. Which chunking was you? What ch chunking strategy was used in the RAG study? Since we got two RAG studies, <laughs> go ahead, Nathan. Uh, yeah, we used a standard uh, recursive split uh, as part of the line chain library. So uh, nothing too special here. All right. So we have a different opinion about Langshane here from mine. So that's why I said strong opinion weekly held here, and your mileage mileage may vary here. So. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think Justin, any any other comments on? Well, yeah, just in terms of chunking, because you pointed out that for us hierarchy was very important, and so that led us to a little bit of a different chunking strategy that we that we used. So, for example, if section four point one point two of a regulation was relevant, and in other words, re returned by the retrieval system, we would also return uh, the super section that contained that subsection, and if there are any subsections beneath it, we would also include those sections to make sure that we were capturing the hierarchy across the section. So a little bit non-standard, but that worked well given the layout of our text and our regulations. Okay, Justin, how did you perform evaluation for the 25 questions? I know the answer, but I wanna hear you say it. Maybe it's also just tell everyone what you tried and why you ended up doing the method you did. Sure. So I sat at my computer and went one by one by one to check the binary accuracy. So I did it manually. Um, I <laughs> did look at Ragus and some of the other techniques like Nathan was talking about. And for our application, I didn't find that it was uh, reliable enough in extracting the pieces of information that were the most relevant. And so therefore, it was giving me a little bit biased perspective of uh, the metrics, mainly accuracy that I was looking for. And given that I didn't have a huge number of questions, I chose to do it manually. So I think if anything, I think Ragus is a really um, impressive tool, but I would recommend anybody double check it just to make sure that its version of accuracy or faithfulness aligns with what you expect given your, well, given your expectations. Okay. Uh, boy, there's so many here, so many questions here. Um... Have you compared your approach to compound or using multiple small LLMs initially proposed by Databricks Berkeley? Okay, so yeah, multiple LLMs in a particular workflow. Um, have we compared our approach? I Maybe I'm not understanding the question, but I think we look at adding additional LLMs as another optimization step technique you can use to improve results. Um, 
I and I guess the the fact, uh, Justin, I guess using agents that was multiple LLMs there, right? In the work, workflow you had. Well, we tested it was a single LLM, but we enable function calling, uh, and so it's a little, I think a little bit different than your question. Um, we okay, so we didn't use. Uh, a mixture or a combination of LLMs and what we looked at in this application. Yeah, I mean, I think I understand the question here is around these compound systems, um, for the reference to the Databricks Berkeley kind of work. But uh, yeah, I, you, you could definitely probably optimize these systems a little bit by adding these kind of additional steps. Um, in, in, our, in our experiment number three, where we combined both the internal knowledge and the external knowledge, we effectively did a little bit of this where we kind of let the LLM kind of do a reasoning step where it was able to kind of choose between those two systems. Um, so, you know, we have the beginnings of that, but you could probably improve uh, the overall performance by um, trying to kind of expand upon that. There's certainly an interesting direction to explore there. Nathan, what is the impact of vector dimensionality for the increase in performance? I think the question meant to be, what is the impact of di vector dimensionality on performance? Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so dimensionality is is kind of set by the embedding model uh, that you end up using. And as you increase the dimensionality, you kind of increase the kind of power for the embedding to represent information. So there's a you know, relatively straightforward uh, relationship between increasing dimensionality and increasing quality because you just simply have more uh, space to operate with. Um, the the trade off here is is that you know higher dimensionality is obviously a little bit more expensive in terms of storage and can be kind of more expensive in terms of like inference costs. So um, I think that's one of the reasons why you see embedding models at different kind of sizes. Uh, being available so that, you know, users can kind of choose which um, which kind of trade-off is right for them uh, in terms of dimensionality. Okay. Uh, I am using RAG on my application. My challenge is that the answer I look for is not on the RAG documents, but inferred from a few of those. And often the documents needed are not directly near the question through embeddings, but are one step away. How can RAG be used to solve complex mm -hmm. questions? So I will just say that's the real world. Like that right there, that's what happens when people try to deploy this stuff because the real world is messy. These are the kind of edge cases you will try to run to in, on any um like, so I think we could probably speak to best practices. Um, I, I, Justin, I know has opinions, Nathan, do you want to try to answer that one as well? Or yeah, I mean, this is, this is definitely, um, where, where the kind of direction of, um, active both like engineering and, and research are going, um, on how to kind of solve this and the reg architecture, I think has a good foundation. I think you can just kind of extend upon it, right? If you can imagine, multiple reasoning steps that happen within a RAG framework where you see the results and then make a decision on whether you need to retrieve more information or whether you need to reframe the question to be able to find it in different portions of the kind of retrieval set. So um, these are very interesting areas of both kind of R&D and actual kind of engineering. And I think we're going to see kind of meaningful progress in, in the near future on, on solving these types of problems. Yeah, and also I do have a strong opinion here because it really depends on the structure of your data and how it's laid out, which you mentioned in your question. So for our particular example, um, one of the examples question that Kevin had on the screen, there was the regulation, but then the regulation depends on definitions. And so the way we actually set ours up, given that structure, is you would get the most relevant uh, regulation, but then you would search the regulation for definitions and then look for those definitions in a, a set that was uh, curated separately. And so we do have these multiple sources of information that can be combined into one context so that effectively the LLM can say, okay, you're talking about salary, but salary is a cost of consideration. Cost of consideration is or isn't under the cost cap, for example. You can do that multi-hop reasoning because you've given it access to multiple uh, pieces, stores of information that think could be combined in context. The layout, of course, will depend on your um, the way your data, your text is laid out in its, in its documents. So Justin, that's the stage to add more context here, right? So I don't have that drawing on the sure. screen, but it's a simplified version of the stage three here. You can see it on the, the on the study site. Sure. Good, great, great, great questions. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Um, All righty. Uh, 
if authentication is a big issue, you would need to run Pinecone locally. Is this supported? I thought uh, just... not not at this time. Okay. Um, this is just some other Pinecone related questions here. I'm not sure which ones of these are. I'll, I'll do my best here, uh, Nathan, if these are mm -hmm. answerable or not. But curious, apologize for this question. Interesting discussions on policy. Are organizations okay submitting vectors to Pinecone? Curious if it can store a lot of metadata that may be sensitive. How different is that to request to NLM? I imagine uh, yeah. it's the Go ahead. I mean, I mean, you know, Pinecone uh, does not kind of look at your data. We are kind of SOC 2 compliant. Um, plenty of our customers store kind of sensitive information within within the database. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure about that one. Do you have rec Do you have recommendations to have the LLM avoid answering things that are unrelated to the RAG documents available, e.g. prevent the end user from abusing <laughs> the question from just asking it to help their writing their school essay. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, can you make a ham sandwich? Uh, so uh, I'm laughing because Justin and I did a, a video a couple of months ago where I, um, where it was a chat with your database uh, video for a bank. And I, one of the questions I said is, you know, is can my, can my dog Charlie open a bank account? So um, how do you prevent, uh, what's an easier way to prevent the user from abusing the, the, the interface? Uh, do you want to take that one, Justin? Sure. So as Kevin said, one way that we've approached that is to put an initial LLM call that just serves as a filter, sort of a gatekeeper to the system. So if a question comes in that's not relevant to the problem you're solving, so if it's unrelated to the, the rag that you're, you're working over, then it rejects that question. It says, try asking a question that's relevant to Formula One or to uh, banking or whatever the case may be. That's been effective for us. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. In Prolegos work with clients, have you found that fine tuning or creating a custom embedding model to improve, I'm sorry, this is the, when new questions come in, this thing jumps around, um, improve retrieval for a domain specific data is ever a high leverage move. No, I can offer my opinion. I think that's no. We have tried fine tuning embeddings. And uh, if you get into a highly technical domain, like something chemistry, biology, medicine, then you may get more mileage out of that approach. But uh, even for some pretty technical domains in say finance and banking, we have not seen a big lift from uh, fine tuning embeddings. That's been our experience. Nathan, anything add to that from your guys' experience? Yeah, I think I, that's that's the same. Uh, fine tuning is excellent for kind of instructing kind of stylistic, uh, you know, um, directions for the model. Like if you wanted to respond in a certain way consistently in terms of tone, but not for infusing information, uh, which is what we're trying to do here. What use cases do you see more traditional BM25 type retrieval is useful in augmenting similarity search? I think BM25 is always worth the test. Um, it's very fast. And if it can, if you can get the same performance with BM25 as with embeddings, you can save a lot of time. Um, it, it depends is a bad answer, but it, it usually it depends on the text and uh, how uh, diverse the vocabulary is. Is it possible to use RAG with streaming or real-time data? We've never run into this, so this is yeah. this is go for you, Nathan. So I'm just like most clients. I probably say let's let's work on something easier, but I don't know. Maybe <laughs> you guys have you, you guys probably work with different situations than we do. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the answer is generally yes. I mean, in, in the sense that you know the time that it takes um, Pinecone to uh, ingest new information is kind of measured in between seconds and minutes. So if that's real time enough for this type of use case, then certainly it can be solved, but it, it might not be um, as real time as maybe the, the author is, is looking for. Uh, okay, so two good questions. Any smaller open source models that you guys have an affinity towards for the purposes of embedding? Um, I uh, So Justin, do you wanna give your uh, just to tell me if you disagree, but my impression from watching our team work is there's a lot of 
optimization choices you can make. The open source ones are all about the same. Just pick one, spend your time doing something else. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think that's right. And if we're talking about embedding models specifically, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of the Synos Transformers library and their collection of uh, embedding models there, MPNet, for example. They run locally easily. Um, anything else on that, Nathan, you want to add? Or... No, I think I would okay. agree in, entirely with the sentiment. Like choo choosing a better model and optimize the rest of your stack. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, any suggestions for adding a feedback layer? Thumbs up, thumbs down without having to fine tune the LLM. Suggest, and I think we were literally just talking about this yesterday. So go right ahead. What's the review in memory, whatever you, is that it? Or is that this applicable to that or not really? I think it could be. This is a little bit more of an advanced topic, but if, if you have a rack system and you're able to collect feedback over it, then giving uh, a, another LLM a chance to go back to things that it got right or did not get right, ask it to review that and create sort of a summary of what was missing in that interaction, storing that in yet another kind of information store that can be retrieved to influence future retrievals or future um, generated responses over retrievals. That's not a... a I'd say it's a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more of an advanced optimization, but yeah, having a system that can learn from feedback, if you can get it right, can be very powerful. Lots of great questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, will Knowledge Graph improve the RAG LLM? Um, I did, Nathan, do you have, we've got opinions on this, not necessarily informed by research, but... I don't know if you guys have a, you even you want to take this one or we could offer what we could think of. I imagine it kind of really depends on your use case. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, right? What type of information you're trying to store in your knowledge graph and what type of questions um, are coming in your query stream. And that would determine whether a knowledge uh, a knowledge graph style database or representation is the right one for for your particular pipeline. Yeah, uh, it, we, I'm really curious about knowledge graphs generally. Um, so I think what we find on a lot of our client projects is that the biggest problem with knowledge graphs is like populating the graph, maintaining the graph, getting people keeping the graph current. This is where, and it, it just becomes, practically speaking, there's just not a lot of great success stories at scale. So sure, if you have a well-populated graph, imagine doing inference across it, but keep in mind the LLM is a graph. So I, I honestly don't know. I just, you know, I when I, we just don't run into a, I don't think it's the first place we would probably want to take a client conversation, to be honest with you, just because it's just so hard to keep them maintained. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, the, the models themselves are pretty good at handling unstructured information. So you don't necessarily gain that much potentially by having this kind of heavily structured uh, relationship graph provided to it. Yeah, the uh, the amount of like investment to get a vector database running on top of an LLM versus to build a knowledge graph from Stack, you know, we're talking the orders of magnitude difference, and I don't doubt it's orders yeah. of magnitude and more important performance there. So, um, geez, so many here. Uh, when should fine tuning be used, if at all, out of the thirteen techniques? Last fine tuning mm -hmm. LLMs. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's, I, unfortunately, I think I see a lot of misinformation out there from people who are either uninformed or, or, or basically selling computing services that, you know, Hey, fine tune for your, your, your particular problem. Um, it's, a, it's, it takes, it's a lot harder than people say it's a lot of work. Look at the Bloomberg example. So Bloomberg fine tuned an LLM on a GPT 3.5, I believe, invested a lot of money into it, into it. And when in GPT four came out, it outperformed their fine tuned LLM on financial data. So you can invest a lot of money. Um, it's a, a last technique if possible. But truthfully, we usually just find other things to focus on for client works. Um, I'm, you will find plenty of other people with different opinions. Um, that's just mine. And Nathan, I'm anything different to offer there? No, no, I think, uh, I think I agree completely. How would you think about multiple time series of clinical notes with multiple years of clinical data? Oh boy, here we go. Okay, <laughs> okay man. somebody's picking an easy one. <laughs> multiple years of clinical notes, multiple years of clinical data. Um, I mean, it seems like a reasonable RAG use case to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would... It sounds really interesting. One thing that I would really think about that is metadata. So if you do have 
you know, um, whether it's patient metadata, timestamp metadata, um, I think not just using sort of embedding based search and retrieval, but any chance that you have to search also on that metadata like um, patient IDs or time or anything like that would probably improve your retrieval performance. Did you have to do anything special with chunking for the exclusion sections of the F1 rules? Question mark. How do chunks in that section know they are under the exclusions or how does the rag system ensure the chunks return to their hierarchy? How does one retain hierarchy in a rag system? Yeah, I can answer this briefly. Yeah. Well, There's also well. big area research, lots of work on this. Keep that in mind, but go ahead, Justin. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, we uh, had a special, well, I didn't mention this earlier, but we had a specialized data structure. So when we parse that PDF, each section uh, populates part of a tree. And so when we retrieve a part, uh, let's say a subsection, because it's stored in a tree data structure, we can easily go up and down that tree to get super and subsections. So for us, it was at the parsing stage, taking that text and storing it in some sort of hierarchical data structure that we can navigate later. Greg, how much longer before you give us the answer? I want to take one more. Take one more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get to so many of them. Um, All righty. Jeez, I am so sorry. There's a lot of here that we've covered already. I'm trying to pick a good one to end on. A lot of pressure for the on the on the last one. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know, and I'm, I'm not going to take one that's a, a tee up for my, my our services here. So I want to I want to try to ask a, a a vector database related one here. Um, All right, so may, I'll just try this one for the lack of a, a best one here. Does RAG plus small model LLM performance hold up with unstructured data? 100% yes. Uh, I think it's actually um, the best suited to unstructured data. I think that is like the, the, the first and most obvious use case. So I think it's definitely we try it. Yeah, Justin. So I have to apologize when I skimmed that in my brain. I I read structured, and so I thought I was going to ask a, a question different than what we've been talking about. So maybe I didn't pick the last one. Uh, all right, can we take one more, Greg? Let's squeeze one more in here. Yeah, one more. One more. Yeah. <laughs> all right, here's a good. Have you found any any quality slash faithfulness improvements by tuning parameters like temperature, sequence, penalty, etc.? Um, I have not played with those parameters. Yeah, go ahead. I was, no, I was going to defer to you because I have not uh, spent a lot of time with those parameters. Uh, no, we, we did experiment with temperature uh, as part of the study, but we didn't feel as if um, like that was a variable that was driving optimization. So. All right. I well, ended on a good note there with a good question. <laughs> great. Thank you so much to Nathan, uh, Kevin, and Justin for the awesome presentation. Thanks to everyone, oh, the hundreds of you we're here chatting, listening, taking notes, asking great questions. Um, we will send you an email follow-up with links, with a recording. Stay tuned for other emails from us about upcoming events. We're going to have more of these online workshops, in-person workshops. We'll have our first Pinecone user workshop in San Francisco in a few weeks. Um, we have our first event in London, in Europe, um, I believe in May, in partnership with AWS. Ooh, when is it? Coming. What's that? When is it? I got I got a trip coming to the UK. I'm gonna have to. All right, we'll, we'll talk offline. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe well, I can get there. Keep an eye on your email inbox, like everybody else. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone. This has been great. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thanks a thanks. lot. Bye.